Well, good afternoon to everybody um, and welcome to the Center for the Americas at the University of Oklahoma and our webinar on travels, translations, and literary imagination in Brazil and the Americas with author Krista Brun. Offering comments will be Professor Paulo Moreira of the Department of Modern Languages, Literatures, and Linguistics at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, Krista Brun got her BA at Princeton and her PhD at the University of California, Berkeley, and is presently a professor at Penn State University. She specializes in modern and contemporary Luso-Brazilian literature through the lens of translation, visual and popular cultures, and intellectual history. Uh, she's published translations of stories by Machado de Assis and Nuno Ramos, and critical articles on documentarian Eduardo Coutinho. She's presently working on a book that situates Lisbon, Rio de Janeiro, Sao Paulo, and New York as sites of encounter and exchange in the Portuguese-speaking world um, by exploring how literary and artistic works depict Portuguese, Brazilian, and Lusophone African interactions in these global cities. She contends that intersections of culture and capital facilitate forms of citizenship that go beyond legal constructs inherited from colonial structures. Another area of her research centers on Latin American popular music and cultural policies. As a Fulbright grantee to Brazil in 2007, she studied the politics of popular Brazilian music in relation to the Nueva Canción and Nueva Trova. Today, uh, Professor Brun will be speaking to us about her first book, Creative Transformations, Travels and Translations of Brazil in the Americas, published last year by the State University of New York Press. This book analyzes key moments in the travels and translations of Brazilian artists and intellectuals from the 1870s to the present. And in doing so, it underscores the continued presence of Brazilians in the United States as a feature of the hemispheric Americas that complicates understandings of Latinidad. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Brun to the Center for the Americas at the University of Oklahoma. Well, thank you so much, Charlie, for the very generous introduction, and also to both the Center for the Americas and also the Center for Brazil Studies at um, OU for this invitation. Releasing a book about hemispheric travels and their literary and cultural repercussions during a pandemic has, that has constricted our ability to travel has been a strange experience. So I feel lucky that our exchanges can unfold uh, virtually in real time today, rather than experience the protractions and delays common in the 19th century forms of transnational communication that I study in the early part of the book. At this point, I'm going to share my screen. Um, Before delving into the theoretical framework for today's talk and my book, I'd like to begin with an anecdote that exemplifies the approach to Brazil and the Americas at stake here. In 1876, the Brazilian emperor Dom Pedro II traveled from Rio de Janeiro to the United States, where he traversed the nation's transcontinental expanse. One of the most noteworthy experiences during his travels was his presence alongside Ulysses S. Grant, the US president, at the opening day of the Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia. Standing in front of the cordless engine, these two leaders turned on the machine that would generate power for the rest of the exhibition halls. Their close collaboration in this task, and you can see the two men here in, the, in front of, so we have Grant on the left and um, and uh, uh, Don Pedro on the right. Um, with their close collaboration in this task serves as an analogy for the type of relationship that Don Pedro longed for Brazil to have with the United States. He was particularly interested in how forms of technology, industry, and education were modernizing the US. The emperor's travels were a fact-finding mission as he observed firsthand these new practices and fostered relationships that could facilitate their implementation in Brazil. This admiration for the US indicated a shift away from Europe and specifically France as the model for Brazilian intellectual and political elites. In part, the affinities between Brazil and the United States are obvious. They are large and diverse countries that pose a challenge to governing. Both nations were late to end slavery and did so in a protracted manner. 
with the practice finally abolished in the United States in 1865 and in Brazil in 1888. As a result of the prolonged period of legalized slavery and subsequent efforts to shape the makeup of the nation through immigration regulations, questions of race, ethnicity, and citizenship are critical to understanding the past, present, and future of these hemispheric giants. Even recent contemporary politics with far-right movements that challenge the foundations and principles of democracy by following leaders who trade in conspiracies and lies point to affinities between the United States and Brazil. In spite of these similarities, it is important to remember key differences between the nations, including, most notably, Brazil's status as the only long-lived empire in the hemisphere from 1822 to 1889, and its periods of dictatorial rule throughout the 20th century. And I say that's only long-lived because there was the brief period of a, a monarchy of an empire in Haiti, but that was very short-lived. By sketching these broad comparisons, I'm not proposing a historical intervention nor a sociological study. I will leave that task to historians and social scientists like Jessica Graham, Nico Segel, and Tiffany Joseph, whose recent works provide new ways to think about race, nation, democracy, and politics in a transnational framework. Instead, I wanted to outline these parallels and points of divergence in order to illustrate how I think about Brazil and the Americas. My approach prioritizes connections and travels between Brazil and the United States. I extend beyond this focus into a broader hemispheric framework of the Americas by emphasizing the connections that Brazilian artists and intellectuals have with Spanish Americans while living in or traveling through the United States. I also consider how reading Spanish American texts and traveling within Brazil and to its neighboring countries contributed to the work of Brazilian writers. I know that by privileging a North-South approach that highlights the presence of Brazilians in the United States, I tend to overlook the possibilities of South-South exchanges between Brazil and Spanish America and translations between Portuguese and Spanish. I would be happy to talk more about and um, more during the discussion session about these comparisons and the important work of other colleagues, including Paulo, who places mm -hmm. the literatures of Brazil, Mexico, and the United States in dialogue. However, it is important to recognize the exceptionalism of Brazil vis-a-vis -vis the rest of Latin America in terms of history, language, and culture. These differences between Brazil and Spanish America have repercussions in the experiences of Brazilian migrants in the and exiles in the United States as they navigate their position and their identity with the broad within the broad category of Latinx. The hemispheric framework that I propose in my book positions the United States as a point of triangulation that facilitates intermingling between Brazilians and Spanish Americans who have often been unduly separated by geopolitical and linguistic borders. Recognizing the longstanding presence of Brazilians in the United States not only expands and complicates definitions of Latinidad, but it also underscores the hemispheric underpinnings of works by Brazilian writers, including Sauls Andrade, Siliano Santiago, and Adriana Lisboa. Now that I've explained my approach to Brazil and the Americas, I would like to turn to another key pair of concepts, travel and translation. The intertwined nature of these experiences is at the heart of my project. Drawing attention to the travels of Brazilian artists and intellectuals to the United States and other parts of the Americas since the 19th century, I argue that their experiences of displacement necessitate acts of translation that have significantly influenced their works. Translation becomes a way of navigating and representing the resulting linguistic and cultural encounters and the related negotiations of complex racial, ethnic, and national identities. By translation, I do not refer solely to what Roman Jakobsen terms, quote, translation proper or interlingual translation. Instead, I conceive of translation in the capacious sense that includes linguistic, cultural, and epistemological levels. With this broad understanding, I contend that translation is essential to Brazil's standing in the Americas, even when it does not seem like translation is explicitly or directly at stake. These translations are often personal acts in response to cross-cultural encounters and other feelings of displacement as Brazilian artists and intellectuals embark on travels that unfold both geographically as they leave their homes for distant regions and intellectually as they read travel narratives and dialogue intertextually with Spanish American writers and theoretical concepts from abroad. During their journeys, these Brazilians comprehend foreign ideas and expressions 
We have forms of translation as creative transformation that in turn shape Brazil's image abroad and especially in the Americas as a nation of contradictions. In theorizing travel and translation as interconnected terms, I built upon two seminal studies from the 1990s, James Clifford's Routh's Travel and Translation in the 19, late 19th, 20th century, and Mary Louise Pratt's Imperial Eyes, Travel Writing and Transculturation. These works interrogate the imperial and colonial practices underlying naturalist and ethnographic travels that document the otherness of the non-Western world. Clifford's framing of travel as a, quote, translation term, end quote, or comparative concept, concept resonates with Lydia Lewis' examination of how the spatial and temporal dimensions of travel generate what she terms the, quote, condition of translation, end quote. Like Louis, I do not consider translation a neutral aesthetic act, but rather as enmeshed in geopolitical, socioeconomic, cultural, epistemological, and ideological realms. While a critical feature of Pratt's contact zones, translation is also intimately connected to ideas of circulation, as Ignacio Infante's study of transatlantic poetry shows, and by extension, world literature, as Pascal Casanova and David Damrosch de 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 demonstrate. Thinking of translation as circulation, especially in relationship to literary markets, calls our attention to the role of what John Milton and Paul Bandia term agents of translation. The main figures that I study in my book serve as agents of translation by, at times, mediating between an individual translator and a final translation, or more frequently, navigating more figurative and conceptual realms. For instance, Jose Carlos Rodriguez, and that's the photo that's in the bottom right corner, um, who edited the New York-based Portuguese language periodical Novo Mundo from 1870 to 1879, facilitated the publication of a serialized and abridged translation of Portuguese into Portuguese of Harriet Beecher Stowe's My Wife and I. In the 1930s, Marie Andrade's correspondence with North American and German translators revealed efforts to enable Macunaima's publication and translation. Silviano Santiago and his students aimed to make Jacques Derrida's ideas more accessible to readers of Brazilian Portuguese with their Glossário de Derrida in the 1970s. Adriana Lisboa's background as a literary translator informs how she interacts with the translators of her novels. I will return to these key figures later in the talk, but for now, I want to highlight how recognizing these artists and intellectuals as agents of translation who also engage in personal acts of linguistic and cultural translation while traveling in and beyond Brazil draws attention to networks of people and texts that shape Brazil's place in the Americas and relatedly global literary marketplace. Before examining these examples more closely, I would like to flesh out an understanding of translation as a critical and creative practice in a way that emphasizes the contributions of Brazilian and other Latin American scholars and critics. Brazilian poets, critics, and translators, Arodica and Augusto de Campos, have embraced the role of agents of translation by promoting obscure foreign writers, including Mayakovsky and the Provençal Truidores, um, and forgotten figures in Brazilian writers, such as Sol Andrade and Pagu. They also experiment with very vocal visual poetics in their own verse and translations and posit new methods of translation. In particular, Arol Campos has contributed a theoretical perspective that emphasizes the aural and visual components of translation. In his 1962 essay, Tradução como Criação e como Critica, on translation as creation and as criticism, proposes a semiotic approach to translation's creative and critical potential. His formulation of translation as transcreation differentiates literal translations from a creative process of recreation governed by an isomorphic relationship. A translation thus is one work among a constellation of texts that recreate the sign and the signified in another language to contribute to the overall meaning of the original. While this idea recalls Walter Benjamin's views of translation as the text's afterlife, Campos does not directly cite the translator's task, Benjamin's famous essay, until Campos' 1985 essay, The Transcriação Poética e Semiótica da Operação Tradutora. 
This piece traces the development of his thoughts on translation since the earlier essay, revealing a sustained dialogue with Jakobsen's linguistic approach to translation and Benjamin's metaphysical concept. Farah and his brother Augusto, who employs the terms tradução arte and intradução, translation can never function as a mechanical reproduction resulting in an exact duplicate of the original in another language. Instead, literary and cultural translators must embark on a creative practice that involves reading and interpreting the work, breaking it down into units of meaning and reassembling it in a different context. And I'm not going to discuss their work um, too much in this presentation, but I also on the slide have mentioned the works of Elsie Vieira, K. David Jackson, and Edwin Glensler, who are really critical in theorizing the sort of link between the, the, Campos, the Campos brothers and the earlier ideas of Osagi Andrade anthropophagia as a way of thinking of these approaches as an anthropophagic um, form of translation. And we can talk more about that in the question and answer if it's a, something that interests you. But now I'd like to switch to thinking more of how this is related, not just to Brazil, but to a broader kind of Latin American understanding of translation. So in line with these theoretical interventions from Brazil, I frame translation as a critical tool for questioning the supposedly peripheral positions of Brazil and the rest of Latin America. My approach to theorizing translation with Latin American texts expands upon that Sergio Weissman's study of Borges's playful approach to translation as questioning concepts of the original and fidelity in translation. Through an astute analysis of Borges' writings on translation, Weissman examines how creative infidelities in translation can test established hierarchies and allow writers from peripheries to exert irreverence with respect to dominant North American or European literatures. In Pierre Menard, Autor del Quixote, and pieces on the Homeric versions and the translator's 1001 Nights, what has stressed the impossibility of a definitive text and its faithful translation by framing translations as versions that add to the meaning of a given work. Placing the ideas of Borges and the Campus Brothers in dialogue underscores the similarities in their visions of translation as creative rewriting that questions ideas of definitive texts and perfect copies. Similarly, as I discussed previously, for literary and translation scholars like Vieira, Jackson, and Gensler, Campos's notion of transcreation embraces Oswald Andrade's ethos of anthropophagie, or cultural cannibalism, by calling for a devouring and digestion of texts, languages, ideas, and cultural practices in order to create something new, or in the sort of pounding idea of make it new again. These theories of literary translation emerging from Latin America establish a critical grammar to analyze the travels, linguistic encounters, cultural exchanges, and creative transformations that have defined Brazil's position in the Americas since the 19th century. To delve deeper into geopolitic, all economic, linguistic, and cultural dynamics of global literary and cultural production to which these Latin American writers respond, I turn to Emily Apter's concepts of the translation zone and the politics of untranslatability. While Apter's work questions the validity of the nation as a category by emphasizing links between translation and transnation, I contend that literature and art created in translation zones, to use her concept, reveal an entanglement of the national and the transnational. In the case of Brazil, the construction of the modern nation unfolded in the 19th century as a transnational process foregrounding ties to the United States due to emerging networks of capital, industry, and higher education. Throughout the 20th century and into the 21st, the nation persists as an imagined community, to evoke Benedict Anderson's concept, and as a cultural construct that contributes to how individuals position themselves in the world. However, engaging with the idea of the nation in the 21st century requires critical self-awareness as Anderson effectively demonstrates in his 20, 2006 afterward, that examines how translation and global circulation of his study transformed the text and his own view of the nation. For literary critic Rebecca Walkowitz, Imagine Communities is an example of what she terms a, quote, born translated, unquote, book. Since translation can contribute to the collective national imaginary and also test the boundaries between these communities and even establish new ones. By crafting born translated literary depictions of Brazilians in the United States, 
Santiago and Lisboa invite a deeper contemplation of connections between nation and translation through transnational aesthetics and transnational exchanges that expand and transforms ideas of what it means to be Brazilian. The travels and translations of Brazilian artists and intellectuals that I study epitomize the metaphorical and physical movement that Homi Baba identifies within migrant and marginal communities living and writing the nation. These writings require doubleness in temporal and spatial representation, or in other words, a form of textual travel rewriting and transformation, also known as translation. By analyzing Benjamin's ideas about the foreignness of language and the untranslatable in relation to cultural difference, Baba showcases the potential of studying literature, art, cultural policies, and social dynamics through the lens of translation. Rather than succumb to the possible limitations of translation for facilitating cross-cultural understanding, he calls on people on the margins and blue borders, quote, to translate the differences between them into a kind of solidarity, end quote. Baba's vision of a new form of transnational alliances between those living on the peripheries recalls Santiago's concept of the cosmopolitanism of the poor. With this reference to the theoretical work of Baba and Santiago, I want to, to pose an important caveat about my project. Though I recognize the value of marginalized peoples and their expressions, they do not appear as a focus in my study which privileges elite cultural figures given their continued critical role in curating Brazil's hemispheric profile. I'd be happy to talk more about how these ideas of marginalized voices intersect with questions of translation or untranslatability um, after the talk. In the remainder of this talk, I would like to provide a brief overview of the texts and materials that constitute the genealogy of key moments in the translation of Brazil in the Americas that I propose in the book. The study opens by analyzing how O Novo Mundo, with its subtitle O Periódico Ilustrado do Progresso da Idade, engaged mm. in literal and figurative translations as it traveled between Brazil and the United States during the 1870s. I just wanted to highlight in this image, and this is the, the, the um, title of the newspaper that appeared on the front cover of every edition, but there's an, a map that has North America, South America, and the liner connecting New York to Rio. So I think that's a visual representation of what the periodical was attempting to do. Um, the periodical conveyed anti-imperial and abolitionist ideals to a readership primarily in Brazil. Its articles celebrated Brazil's natural resources and urged elites to transform models of modernization seen in the United States to the specificities of Brazil, rather than merely copying them. By documenting the travels of North American scientists, most notably Charles Frederick Hart, who at the time was a geologist based at Cornell University in Brazil, and also by Pedro, Don Pedro in the United States, the periodical articulated a hemispheric outlook grounded in bilateral exchanges and shared investments in political, socioeconomic, cultural, educational, and technological modernization. The 1876 Centennial Exhibition in Philadelphia, which I previously showed a picture of the Inauguration Day, with its interest in progress, received significant coverage in Novo Mundo with articles and images portraying for Brazilian readers how the nation projected itself as a modern yet tropical on a global stage. So these are two images that were lithographic reproductions that appeared in the pages of the Novo Mundo. And the image that says Brazil, this is Brazil's display and its section that was in the main hall. And you can also think of the aesthetic um, choices and the sort of arabesque architecture that doesn't correspond with what we think of as Portuguese or Brazilian architecture, but yet is somehow a recognizable uh, vision of otherness within the late 19th century United States and also noting its prominent position next to the Netherlands, right? So it's alongside European nations and powers, right? It's not marginalized to the outskirts of the main hall. This other image is of the agricultural hall. And we have this idea of Brazil featuring animal hides, furs, sort of the exotic natural resources, right? As well as, and this, in the lithographic print, it doesn't come through as clearly in the photographs, but this is an image of the cotton hall. 
that was a, a house a sort of feet structure made entirely of cotton. Again, emphasizing okay. natural resources that were from Brazil, but that would also be of interest to people in the United States. So, to further examine the hemispheric underpinnings of Brazilian culture in the 19th century, I turned my attention to Novo Mundo sections on literature. So in addition to having this focus that was very explicitly on industrial progress, technology, education, the centennial exhibition, there were also sections and pages in each issue on literature. For instance, the poet Joaquim de Sousa Andrade, Sousa Andrade uh, contributed to the journal While Living in New York from 1871 to 1885, which is a key example of that Brazilian's role in the United States states for at least the 19th century. During his residence in the city, he composed his epic Ugueza, one of the forgotten works, Brazilian works that the Campos brothers have recovered in their criticism. The critiques of speculative capitalism that Sosandraji articulates in the Wall Street Inferno, and the Wall Street Inferno is a term that the Campos brothers use that um, Sosandraji himself did not use, betray a less celebratory vision of US modernization than the novo mundo. Invested in ideas of progress and hemispheric solidarity, the periodical emphasized this view in the literary realm by publishing an 1873 essay by Joaquim Maria Machado de Assis on the instinct of nationality, which argues that authors do not need to depict local color to be considered Brazilian. And this is often how the Unovo Mundo appears in literary criticism, as, as this place that first published Machado's essay. But Unovo Mundo also published literary translations and paired with its linguistic and cultural ones to indicate the centrality of translation to the periodicals, hemispheric travels and connections in the late 19th century. Moving forward about 50 years, Maruji Andrade's 1928 modernist masterpiece, La Cunaima, invites an exploration of how translation continued to facilitate negotiations and critiques of Brazil's contradictions in the early 20th century. Reading the Rhapsody in conjunction with debates about its translations, adaptations, and intertextual dialogues highlights travel and translation as essential to the creation and circulation of Macunaima as a character and a text in the Americas. After analyzing Macunaima as an exemplary transcreation due to Andrade's transformations of Theodor Kronberg's documentation of indigenous myths and legends, I consider the difficulties that this innovative work posed to the subsequent translators. So here's um, Kronberg's, the cover of his work, which was published slightly before Makunaima, but Andrade's work and is often based as the sort of the source material for Andrade's novel. Um, and Kronberg was a German ethnologist who traveled um, widely through the Amazonian, especially the Roraima Valley and the Orinoco regions. So letters between Margaret Richardson Hollingsworth and Andrade about her incomplete and unpublished English translation in the 1930s underscored these challenges and that created a space for Andrade to rehearse his own incipient theory of translation. Subsequent translations have approached the text with varying degrees of success, ranging from E.A. Goodland's widely criticized 1984 English translation to Hector Olea's praised 1977 Spanish transcreation. Later attempts at circulating the novel beyond national and linguistic borders revealed the need for creative adaptations to reach a broader public. I contend that the afterlife of Makunaim in the Anglo-American context has unfolded primarily, at least until now, through Joaquim de Pedro de Andrade's 1969 film and Pauline Melville's 1997 Guianese novel, The Ventriloquist Tale. I've included here the image of the poster for its initial circulation in English, which is, um, is both a cut version, slightly shorter than uh, Joaquin or than Andrade's full length film, but also gives you a sense of how this film was marketed to a US audience. Um, and reading some of the examples, for instance, Makunaima, 95 Minutes of Brazil and Max, other things, it gives you a sense of the sort of how it was inserted into a type of um, film vocabulary that is often quite contradictory from the actual images of Makunaim of the film, if you're familiar with Joaquim Pedro Gendaraji's film. Um, and New Line Cinema at the time was also the cinema that was circulating John Waters' films. So to give you a sense of how it was kind of introduced into um, a US audience. 
But going off of that, um, so analyzing the film as an irreverent and intersemiotic translation of Andrade's text and the ventriloquist's tale as a fictional reimagination of Makunaima in the narrator's role frames these works as creative transformations that extend the life of the original and contribute to the visibility of this folk trickster in the Americas. It is worth noting how Melville's novel opens up an intertextual conversation between national literatures that, despite their shared Amazonian border, rarely dialogue. Makunaima's textual trajectory indicates translation centrality for the creation and circulation of literatures of the Americas, while also revealing that demands for linguistic and cultural translations emerge even when travels located mainly within Brazil. So unlike the other figures I'm talking about, Andrade never left, uh, never left Brazil with the exception of a travel into the Peruvian Amazon. So these are mostly travels within from Sao Paulo to the Amazon to other regions of Brazil. The years of military dictatorship in Brazil in the Southern Cone offered another key moment for hemispheric solidarity and rethinking the nation especially for Silviano Santiago, as he lived and worked in voluntary exile in the United States. During this period, he developed a critical concept of the space in between, which I read as a product of travel and translation. First presented in 1971 as a lecture in French in Montreal, the essay was expanded in a Portuguese version published in Santiago's seminal collection, Uma Literatura nos Tropicos, and later translated into English as the space in between of Latin American discourse. Here's the image of the, of the covers of both the Portuguese version and also a really key translation of Santiago's text for those of you interested in reading his essays. Its trajectory between languages and nations parallels Santiago's travels between Brazil, France, and the rest of the Americas, applying French theory, most notably concepts from Foucault and Derrida, to Latin American works Santiago proposes the space in between as a discursive realm from which Latin Americans always speak or write back to the United States and Europe. He supports his theorization with literary examples from Borges and Cortázar that illuminate the possibilities of creative infidelity in translation. Discussing the space in between through the lens of translation, rather than post-colonial or post-structural studies, reveals the concept's political potential for questioning and subverting hierarchies that tend to prioritize the original over the copy. In addition to situating Santiago's essay in the realm of translation studies, I examine how travel and translation intersect in fictional works about Brazilians in the United States. His 1985 novel, Still in Manhattan, and the short story collections, Keith Jett and Blue from 1996, and Historias Mal from 2005. And just as a note, for those of you who are interested, Stella Manhattan has been translated into English um, by George Udyssey, and excerpts from uh, Historias Mal Contadas has been translated into English. To capture the linguistic and cultural in-between of Brazilians and other Latin Americans in the United States, Santiago integrates specific allusions and Spanish and English phrases into his Portuguese prose. Attempts at communication by Brazilians in the United States can generate mistranslations and misunderstandings. The story Uber Borum, or Blot, which appeared in the Stores Macontadas, for example, captures how constructs of race do not translate smoothly from Brazil to the United States, as the narrator, a lightly fictionalized version of Santiago, travels by bus from New Orleans to Albuquerque, New Mexico. The plot refers to the wound that the character experiences when he has not served at a steakhouse in Fort Worth and realizes that, while his education and class background grant him a certain status in Brazil, he is perceived as Black in the U.S. South. In, this, sto in his, this story and his other works about Brazilians in the United States, Santiago employs code switching and diverse cultural references to craft a translational prose that resists facile translation and points to barriers that impede cross-cultural understandings. This focus on more recent literary works continues with my reading of Adriana de Boa as Santiago's literary descendant, given the intersections of travel and translation in her narratives. Translation is a particularly useful mode to analyze de Boa due to her experience as a translator from French and English, her thematic explorations, and her work's relative success in translation. With prose that captures how travelers and migrants move between languages and cultures, 
Her novels serve as a case study of the possibilities and limitations of translation in contemporary Brazilian literature. This book creates fictional characters whose displacements require their exploration of unfamiliar settings via forms of linguistic and cultural translation, an element particularly apparent in her depictions of Brazilians living in the United States in Azul Corvo, which was published in 2010 and translated in 2013, I think, as Crow Blue, and Anoy from 2013. Attention to the oft overlooked role of Brazilians in the United States especially in connection to other Latin Americans and Latinx communities, sheds light on how translations facilitate hemispheric encounters across languages, cultures, races, and nations. Lisboa's recent novels suggest both a preference for market translatability, since, as her translator Alison and Trekin notes, her narrative style is fairly accessible and easy to translate, and, though less obviously, the need for a politics of untranslatability that can resist homogenizing language and identity. Azul Corvo Nanoi portray the linguistic, cultural, and racial differences that Brazilians face in the United States by integrating English and Spanish words and cultural references into her Portuguese prose. Without glosses or explanatory, explanatory notes, her born translated books force Brazilian readers to confront a sense of displacement and, as a result, elicits greater empathy for her, with her characters' experiences as migrants, exiles, and travelers. Her prose captures misunderstandings across languages and cultures that resist translation, such as the racial and ethnic categories on the census documents, and thus point to the need for a politics of untranslatability that rejects commodifying narratives for the global literary marketplace. As a political gesture, this approach to representing migrant lives recognizes that there, there are lived experiences cultural references, and forms of code switching that cannot be flattened into homogenous narratives of world literature. As a means of conclusion, I examine broader concerns of what it means to translate Brazil now by considering how the market shapes which voices remain excluded from this partial process of translation. I turn my attention to other dilemmas of translation that impact the literary profile and cultural prominence of Brazil in the Americas, namely retranslation and untranslatability. By retranslation, I refer to new translations of previously translated works, such as the recent New Directions translations of Clarice Lispector's novels and complete short stories, and the competing English versions of Machado's Memoria Fossumas de Brás Cubas, published last year, one translated by Flor de la Thompson and published by um, Penguin Classics, and another translated by Margaret Jewel Costa and Robin Patterson, published by Liverite, and that appeared within, I think, about a week of each other. Rather, so examining retranslation draws attention to the global literary marketplace and, more pertinently, the creative agency of translators. Rather than accept translatability as the dominant aesthetic, I consider what an what a politics of untranslatability would look like for Brazilian literature in the Americas. Embracing untranslatability would involve maintaining the linguistic strangeness and cultural specificities of texts, words, and ideas often deemed untranslatable by continuing to attempt to interpret their strangeness and render it into another language without minimizing or erasing the distinctiveness. Permitting spaces of untranslatability complements retranslation by allowing for a broader range of Brazilian voices, aesthetic forms, and critical practices to circulate within the Americas. In recent years, smaller publishers, alternative venues, websites like Words Without Borders, and the university process have begun to embark on such a necessary and challenging task. Their approach has facilitated the circulation of works by Amerindians, Afro-Brazilians, and other marginalized peoples of Brazil in English language translations as evidenced by the publication of Yanomami Shaman Davi Copenawa's The Falling Sky and Favela Reis Giovanni Martins' The Sun on My Head. The in-progress retranslations of Makunaima by Katrina Dodson, which should be coming out next year by News Directions, and Grande Sertão Veredas by Alison and Trekin, also suggest the importance of translators' decision to engage with untranslatables instead of simply domesticating or avoiding them. Their works promised a new entry in the genealogy of translations of Brazil and the Americas that I have outlined here. With this book, I aim to create awareness of the politics of translation 
in the context of Brazil by focusing on travels and translations with their creative infidelities from the 19th century to the present. The concepts of retranslation and untranslatability point to future creative possibilities and research opportunities for analyzing how Brazilian literary and cultural texts challenge dominant politics of translation that demand either flattening difference or celebrating the exotic. Thank you. Thank you very much, Krista. That was most interesting. And, uh, <laughs> I really appreciated the graphic information as well. It uh, communicated a lot as well. Um, for those of you who are attending, if you have questions uh, for our speaker, uh, please use the Q&A function. The, the chat is actually disabled, but you can enter questions there in the Q&A function. Um, at this point, um, I'd like to turn things over to Pablo Moreira, who um, will be offering some comments and some questions. Um, uh, Paulo uh, has a doctorate in comparative literature from the University of California at Santa Barbara. Uh, after teaching at Yale for nine years, he's now come to the University of Oklahoma uh, as an associate professor. Uh, he has several articles on Brazilian, Mexican, U.S., and Latin American literature, cinema, and culture. Um, he's published two books, uh, Localismo Modernista, Faulkner, Gemaires Rosa, and Rufo and a book called Literary and Cultural Relations Between Brazil and Mexico, Deep Undercurrents. He's currently working on a book tentatively called Journey into Latin American Imagination. Uh, so please um, uh, welcome uh, Paulo Moreira. Thank you, Charles. Thank you, Krista, for your presentation. Um, um, I'm going to make uh, 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 a few comments and uh, of course, uh, leave a few questions for you to comment on, uh, and I'm not even sure if I should uh, uh, lay them all out or at once, or if I should wait for your responses first. We'll see how that goes. I don't want also to take up too much of our time. I want the, the other participants to be able to ask questions and, and have a conversation with you. Um, I'd like to call attention um, to the way that Christa, Christa Brun's uh, book offers a series of very interesting uh, dislocations or displacements of texts. Uh, for me, I'm a person who studied, you know, my undergraduate stud studies in Brazil, so I studied literature in Brazil, um, and and uh, and I I kind of know the 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 the, the state of criticism, literary criticism in Brazil. And I find it, for example, very interesting, the idea of reminding us that Instinto de Nacionalidade, the, the instinct of nationality, was first published in a periodical such as Mundo Novo, a periodical being uh, produced and printed in the United States, in New York, and uh, with that kind of continental outlook. Uh, I've you know, this is a text from Machado de Assis that has been um, talked about extensively by many people, but I think it really um, changes, at least it changed my conception of the audience of the text, right? Because it's, instead of being a text written in Brazil for Brazilians, and Brazilian writers, it becomes something else. It becomes also a text that comes to play in a, in a continental, um, international or transnational um, uh, stage. I thought this was, this was very, very interesting. I also thought it was fascinating to think of Makunaima, especially its, its uh, two resurrections, Makunaima resurrected as, as a film, and then the, the, the character, Makunaima, resurrected again in the work of Pauline Melville. I thought it was uh, fascinating to look at Makunaima through those um, uh, lenses. And uh, I, I, I agree with you that Makunaima um, has become Brazilianized in the late 60s that the Makunaima in the film, in the, uh, from the film, is, is more markedly Brazilian than the Makunaima from Mario de Andrade, which was more uh, continental, right? Uh, playing the devil's advocate, I would say that Makunaima is a bit of an outlier in the book because it's the one, uh, the book produced by a writer who 
barely left the country stayed most of the time so the the the, the although you know i i like to think and i think that's what you used to the travel here is more of a, like an intellectual travel as well the reading of books and texts from other cultures in other languages and how that comes to bear in the creation of Makunaina. Um, I think it was especially uh, felicitous, the idea that you made the notion very important in Brazilian culture and very discussed in Brazilian culture, the notion of anthropophagia, okay? uh, which could be translated roughly as cannibalism. It's, 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 it's a concept it appeared in, in, and I'm just I'm talking here to the audience in general. It's a concept. It, it has appeared in a manifesto, and it's a it's a it's a sort of a, a decolonial manifesto before decolonial manifestos called themselves that. So anthropophagy is a very interesting way of uh, talking about um, uh, being anti-colonial uh, without being chauvinistic, without uh, falling into a nationalism that 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 wants to ignore or wants to exclude what is foreign from from its from its purview, and I loved the way the book makes anthropophagia play with the concept of travel. Would love to listen to a bit more comments from you, Krista, on on the way that the concept of travel and translation comes to bear with the concept of anthropophagy. I think it, it is very interesting. Now, moving to uh, the issue of translation, um, uh, I'm going to say this. When I was in ter in, on tenure track, I had already been working on translation. In one of the first uh, meetings I had with my advisors, they told me, no translations. Not work with translations now until you get your tenure. What we want is a book, a monography. Translations are not going to give you tenure, right? And and I would like to know if you if you have received similar uh, uh, advice and how do you feel that this? I personally feel that this goes against the mission of universities, because the mission the universities should be spearheading translations of less commercial or older literature. Uh, and and uh, and uh, this is a mission of universities in the culture at large, right? We should not refrain from interfering in cultural affairs by uh, producing translations. I think this is very important, and I think your your book makes wonderful arguments in that sense as well. I loved uh, towards the end of the book, your assessment of the current state of translations of Brazilian literature into English. And I would invite the audience, if you have any questions about this, Krista uh, has, have a look at the book, get the book, because it, it, it will, it'll tell you a lot about it. And, and, or if you want to ask her any question uh, in that sense, you should, because, um, uh, she can give you a pretty accurate, um, portrait of, of the current state of translations of Brazilian literature um, into English. I have a question. Should we here at academia purposefully go against the market, the book market, or should we accommodate ourselves or work alongside the market? That is a question that I'll leave uh, for you to comment on. Um, and uh, I, among a number of interesting concepts that were brought together in this book, the idea of the born translated literature, I think is very interesting, very useful for Adriana Lisboa's work. And I would like you to uh, make the comment. I, I, I liked very much the discussion of this concept in, in your book, and maybe you could comment on that, on the different understandings of the notion of translatability what it means when we say a book is more translatable than the other. I think you offered sort of conflicting versions of, of this notion and I, and, I, and I thought it was very uh, interesting. Um, moving to another important pillar of your book, which is the idea of the untranslatable, this concept coming from Barbara Cassin and, and, and especially worked in the United States with Emily Apter. Right. Um, I particularly think that the untranslatable is the 
the, these words or terms or turns of phrase or passages that uh, resist a uh, straightforward translation. I, I like to see them, and I think Barbara Kassan has written about it in a very interesting manner. Uh, the untranslatable is that which forces a language, which if the translation is into English, which forces English to expand itself in order to translate something that comes from another language. And because of that, it is an exercise on the enrichment and enlargement of the target language. That is, the more we translate, the more we force English to become richer, to become larger, to, 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 to absorb, if using the term of anthropophagia, to gobble up <laughs> um, uh, ways of looking at things and ways of describing things and ways of talking about things that we don't have in English nowadays. Uh, but I would like also to call attention to some uh, interesting detail. Barbara Kassan's book has been translated into English. It's a very important study. It's, well, it's, she is an editor. She's not the only author. But it's called The Dictionary of Untranslatables, a Philosophical Lexicon. We've, uh, you discussed it in your book. It is interesting because the title, the original title in French is European Vocabulary of Philosophies, a Dictionary of Untranslatables. So I would like to call the attention of everybody here and, and your attention, Krista, the way that the European has been dropped in the translation, which for me is a sign of one particularly pernicious, pernicious side of what we call cosmopolitanism, which is to, to drop what is particular. In this case, the book is about European languages specifically, and to, to drop that particularity right? and, to, and to claim the book to be saying something universal. Right? So it is a dictionary of untranslatables from all over the world. While the original title says it's a book of the untranslatables in European languages uh, uh, specifically, so uh, uh, you know this 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 is something that uh, I've also given a lot of thought about. You know the the, the idea of what is universal, uh, and what is a universal, and how often the universal is nothing but um, a way of turning something specific into something general. Uh, of, of imposing a certain characteristic on on the world at large um, as universal, uh, and and if you could comment on that, I would really appreciate it. I, I'm sure you have uh, interesting things to say um, about this. Um, um, I think you talked about transnational relations, and you talked about translation uh, in your book extensively. It was so inter in in many interesting ways, and opening new and interesting vistas into a series of important works of Brazilian literature. And and uh, I want to ask you if you think there's a difference in this transnational relations when there is a power imbalance between the natures and the cultures involved. I'm saying this because I have worked with the relations, the transnational relations between Mexico and Brazil, for example. And, 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 and something is not there, which is uh, uh, imperialism or neocolonialism or, or globalism or whatever names we want to give it to this. But the relationship between Mexico and Brazil is not as charged as the relationship between the United States and Brazil. And uh, and, and uh, I would say that the, relation, the, the, the way the relationship is charged, the relationship between Brazil and the United States, or between Mexico and the United States for that matter, uh, there is a constant dialectic, I would call it a dialectic, uh, of a, a double sense of superiority or inferiority embedded in the view of cultural difference. That is, every time somebody thinks of a cultural difference, here in the US or in Brazil, it has a tendency to be framed as a sign of either superiority or inferiority instead of simply a sign of difference. That is, 
uh, we have differences, of course, uh, particularities, Brazilians and, 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 and US uh, culture. Um, and, uh, but they tend to be framed sort of obsessively into this idea, They're either a sign of, of cultural superiority or a sign of cultural inferiority. S some people even become almost schizophrenic moving between <laughs> bipolar, me moving between uh, a sense of superiority uh, and a sense of inferiority uh, towards uh, the, the United States. And I would like to hear if you had something um, um, uh, to say about that, right? Um, I will, I will, I don't want to overburden people. So I'll, I'll give just one last uh, um, comment. I thought it was very interesting that your book also um, gathered together, put together in, in dialogue, a number of interesting um, concepts of translation. And I would like to um, ask you about uh, the way you relate Haroldo de Campos and his reflections about translation as transcreation and, 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 and the way he talks about translation with Venuti's ideas on translation. On that matter, I will add a last little uh, twist. I, 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 am, I am part of a sort of a community of translators in Brazil. Tra you know, translators in Brazil are very busy translating um, texts in English into Portuguese uh, uh, and other languages as well. And, and, and some of us have noted that, there, that the ideas of Venuti are Uh, because Venuti says it's important to um, sort of uh, let foreignize your translation, to let the foreign signs of, of, of the original text um, become visible in the translation. And, and how this concept uh, in Brazil um, is a bit... Uh, inconvenient because we have a problem of translations that that have too much English in them uh, um, uh, with the needless adoption of neologism neologisms for example the tendency to use the word teen or in Brazilian pronunciation teen for adolescents uh, for adolescentes or or the word bike for bicicleta or the word franchise for franquia or the word sale or liquidação, all, all of these words exist in, in Portuguese. And there's a tendency of using them because they look fa they, they sound fancy in English. Uh, and also some term, terms of phrase. And that is another a, a a different uh, situation. Uh, uh, for instance, the use of the word realizar, which is a false cognate with realize. And to use it in Portuguese as Precisamos realizar um problema in the sense of we have to realize the problem. But, but in, in Portuguese, you don't... Well, usually, maybe it's a new use of realize. Maybe realize is expanding in Portuguese. I'm not that... I'm not very uh, conservative or afraid of, of changing the language. So, but, you know, some people say... Or, for instance, tomar por garantido as take for granted. Uh, então, é, é, ele me tomou por garantido, he took me for granted, which in Portuguese is, sounds, well, it's foreign sounding <laughs> uh, in, in, in that way. Uh, I've, I've, I've even seen people saying, eu fui dado uma oportunidade, like I was given an opportunity. But the passive voice for the verb dar in Portuguese is, does not work in this way, uh, usually. You know, I accept that this may change in the future, but I mean, these translators talk about the way that uh, translating into English and not making a proper effort to, 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 to use Portuguese <laughs> changes uh, 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 the language. Uh, and, and, and I would like to, to I would love to, to hear a comment about that, if you will. So you can choose whatever you want to talk about. I, I will stop here. So I'll give time to everybody uh, to participate. Thank you. Thank you very much, Pablo. Um, so we do have a bit of time, and um, the uh, Q&A is open for anyone else who would like to add questions. But obviously, a great <laughs> an agenda of questions has been offered. 
And so, Krista, why don't you just go ahead and get started on what you want to what you want to respond to? All right, there's a lot to respond to here. Um, I think I'll kind of go from most the most recent question you offered and kind of work my way back through okay. this sort of series of questions. Okay. So the idea of thinking of and what you were describing about this kind of constant use of the like loan words from English into Portuguese translations, it makes me think of sort of the ways in which say Spanish is changing given the sort of presence of an increasing population of Spanish speakers in the United States and the various things. And I remember a friend and colleague in Lingua saying how like language is this constant thing that's alive and is changing. And so while there's this element and danger of having too many loan words of that association that you're describing between the sort of chicness, right, of including English yeah. in the Portuguese. It's like, okay, yeah, sailing, sailing, right, instead of liquidação. But there's mm -hmm. something about, so I, I don't feel like in that sense, it's a kind of use of following Zanuti's idea of the foreignization of the translation. How it seems uh -huh. to me more of a linguistic concept of the ways in which language is alive and is changing and is often influenced by forms of contact, right? And the sort of contact that is present through cultural forms, right? Whether it's through the actual literary yeah. text or also just the media consumption. I think of like television advertisements and the number of programs, right? And the movies that are like popular in Brazil and the TV shows that are popular often are English. And so, the, and they're not dubbed, they're necessarily. And there's this, so there's this, infusion right of words in English that then is at times introduced and so I also think you see this now in and this is some of what I was seeing in Adrian Lisboa's work but I can think you can say it's sort of brought more broadly in contemporary Brazilian fiction of this yeah. use of words in English when there is yeah. a word among contemporary Brazilian writers that sort of is maybe either an indication of a type of kind of a cultural eliteness or a sort of their business class. And so using business terms that are in English when there are the same business words in Portuguese. However, because of that field, there's just an infusion of those words. So uh, it's an interesting question. That I think linguistic colleagues would have probably something even more interesting to say about. But in my mind, it seems like there's this a question of how language is being used and what is perceived as, again, related to your other question uh -huh. of these power imbalances, right? As a linguistic, the power yeah. imbalance between language itself. And I think that also raises an important question of Venuti's ideas, right? Where Venuti talks about in his book on the scandals of translation, he moves a bit away from this insistence on we need to embrace a foreignizing practice as translators rather than domesticating the talks, but talks instead okay. about the trade imbalances. And he even brings uh -huh. up Brazil as an example of this, where Brazil translates so many more works from English into Portuguese than the United States mm -hmm. or Anglophone markets ever translate from Portuguese into English. I think that's the question where we see both the imbalances of language, but also of this sort yes. of literary and cultural markets mm -hmm, um, mm -hmm. yes yeah and which i see by the way as an advantage to us brazilians i think if we translate more it's better for us i mean i would like to translate even more from from all uh, also not only from english of course but yeah. um yeah. Well, and I think it's also something that it enriches, it's a positive, if anything, yes. that the U.S. should learn more, because there's one thing that's often yes. lamented within publishing fields, and especially among translators in the United States, is mm -hmm. that only 3% of work, works that are published in English in the United States are translations. And of that, I think it's 0.7% are literary translations. So if you're thinking of everything that's published in a year, it's this yes. very small percentage and, and then you think, what is that that's coming from Portuguese? And from Portuguese, who is it that's being translated? And often it's maybe the Paulo Coelho and these sort of, these, those figures that are more translated yes. for thinking of the numbers, um, which also raises these other questions of the market, which was one of your earlier yeah, questions. Yes. And I yes. think that yes. the idea of the market, of what we should do as academics and as literary scholars or as translators, I think in some ways, if we're in this role and have a space where you're not governed as much by the literary market, there should be a space mm -hmm. to accept and think and work on challenging texts 
right? Someone like yeah. the fact that Katrina is now working on retranslating Makuna Ima and has been spending yeah. you know, many years on it. Alison and Trekin has been working for five years. This idea of that fact that in an academic position, there isn't the necessary to produce, you know, every six months a new translation because you need the, you need that freelance salary to move on to your next project and support yourself, I think invites a space yeah. for, for translating difficult works, for thinking mm -hmm. of works. And I think it relates to your question or your comment about the really the mission of the university should be in some ways to think about what translations can do, how to translate, how to integrate works that are maybe really key in Brazilian, Mexican, Argentine, Cuban context, and yet have had either translations that are out of print, have never been translated, or have been sort of marginalized within the canon. I was thinking recently of, you know, 19th century Brazilian women writers that are like, there's someone like Julia yeah. Lopez de Almeida, who's... Yeah even somewhat marginalized within the Brazilian cert, but it's becoming, and there's been a reinterest, a renewed interest in her work, and yet her mm -hmm. work hasn't been translated. And yeah. even though there's a way, and so I think in some ways as academics, there's a way to help kind of revive and generate renewed interest in these writers. Um, and I think in some ways, what you're doing at your department at OU, has a part of this with the World Literature Day and Latin American Literature Today publications yeah. that is at least mm -hmm. recognizing and publishing translations and seems to be creating yeah. a space for it in which, um, yeah, I received similar advice. Like, yeah. that's nice that you're interested mm -hmm. in translation. Don't really pay attention to, don't work that much on that until you get the book out, until yeah. you do other things. And even I have senior colleagues who, received NEA and NEH grants for translations they're working on and to be promoted to other positions, they've still had to publish their monographs. Uh -huh. I think a way uh -huh. to think about it and to change, and I was talking to a colleague um, recently at a panel at the ACLA about translation, that some institutions have to, are changing their thoughts about this. And but it involves like writing a memorandum of understanding to the deans to say, translation is valuable work. And we recognize yes. that a translation and a critical edition is as valuable as a monograph and has more pedagogical value. Um, and so I think my colleagues, my colleagues in 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 medieval, we, we have we have a number of, of colleagues uh, doing medieval studies in different languages. They have they accept you know um, 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 annotated translations, and I think we should do the same. Oh, I definitely agree. But I think it's a question of also changing, making sure the deans and the sort of people in power yeah. and the people in the field are aware of that. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I think it seems like there's maybe a shifting tide about that and the sort of mm -hmm. recognition of the scholarly and the research work that goes into translations, yeah. that goes into um, you know, understanding what does this word mean? What is actually the flora or the fauna that's described by this word that you may pass over when you're reading it and even writing about it because I don't need to know what that particular Amazonian flower is, but I'm translating it though, yeah. I really do. Um, mm -hmm. So the, those sorts of questions, I think um, really, yeah, are critical for us to think about, especially related to the other question of how do we think of the future of Portuguese, the future of Brazilian studies, roles of classes and sort of the pedagogical practices of these departments. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But I guess, let me try to think through. Oh, okay, so the other ideas that you were mentioning or that you raised about the idea of um, Barbara Kassen and the idea of the dictionary of the untranslatables is really, mm -hmm. um, it's fascinating, like you mentioned that the fact that the European was dropped, but the editors, from my understanding, made that a very conscientious decision, not because it was dropped, it only focusing, it was also a broadening. So it started to include words from other contexts, started to include rather than yeah. just specifically, okay, we'll only have sondage as we'll expand to think of other words. There are some entries from Arabic. So it seems like it was a gesture of the editors of Apter, Michael Wood, and others to think through this project. Also, there's a danger of saying that something like Portuguese and Spanish and French are only European languages when they're spoken yes. in other parts of the world. Um, yes. And seems in some ways like an effort at a, not necessarily a universalizing, but more of a kind of 
decolonial gesture of say we're going yeah. to recognize the expansion i don't know i think it's you have to look more yeah. at the practices and the problems are that the people who are involved with it focus on french english german european traditions and are more invested in continental philosophy but i think uh -huh. there could be ways to see what the project is doing itself as a kind of as shifting the framework and not having it so embedded uh -huh. and rooted in in philosophy itself but also specifically europe and recognizing that the sort mm -hmm. of more global natures of what were former colonial languages. Um, let me think, I'm kind of going through. The other idea that was related, I think what you were saying about the idea of the untranslatable and the way that they're proposing it as this idea of how it can both enrich our languages, enrich English, deepen the understanding. And as I've described it, and as I think of it, and especially in relationship to the works of, say, the work that Katrina is doing right now with Makunaima or with the translation of Guimanez Haas's work, there's the way in which the untranslatable is that which we have to keep on returning to, right? It's not that it mm -hmm. is impossible to translate, yeah. but it's the work that requires continual sort of a recurrent return. And, and rethinking of the words and an engagement with them at a deeper level. And in mm -hmm. some ways, I see this idea of the untranslatable related to, in some ways, this at least untranslatable in this philosophical understanding of Kassin and after, as related to a different way of approaching translatability that ties in mm -hmm. more mm -hmm. to what both Adolf Campus and also Walter Benjamin say of like the works mm -hmm. that have if we think of translatability as an inherent characteristic, right, this thing that's defined and governed by the text itself in Benjamin's terms, he thinks that the texts that are have this greater quality, right, that are more interesting and original and have a sort of polished nature of the language are the ones that invite more sort of returns and are therefore more translatable because you have to keep thinking of them, you have to keep polishing. And there's something that the in his writings also Campus thinks of it in the same way, right? He thinks of there's this way in which you know the poet poetry or works that he describes as more poetic yet in prose. So thinking of mm -hmm. and in that he lists you know uh, Guimaraes Hawes and Makunaim, Osaji Andrade's prose, various sort of writers that invite a return that are in because mm -hmm. they have this density and interest and richness in the literary text they require mm -hmm. and invite more translation and so i was trying mm -hmm. to in the book as you pointed out trying to think through and question our tendency to think of the translatable or the translatability as solely a market-based definition i think there's a tendency to think of the sort of commonplace facile definition of the translatable is what is easy to translate and even mm -hmm. translators mm -hmm. themselves i think when in is describing this bolas work she returns to that of it's easy to translate therefore it's translatable but if we think through what some mm -hmm. of these critics have said about the, what is translatable and what they find as inviting more translations it's actually these works that are difficult right there's works that require interpretation that require this sort of deeper understanding and also require creativity and transformation in the process and so mm -hmm. i think that sort of moving away from market-based definitions of translatability as mm -hmm. easy to mm -hmm is a way to also move toward a kind of a more of a politics of untranslatability within mm -hmm. both the market and broadly the academy. Um, I think there were other ideas that you mentioned and um, I could talk more about, but I also want to see if there are questions or other sort of comments in that sense. Um, I don't see any in the chat or in the Q&A. Yeah, there's none right now in the Q&A. Um, I, was, I, I had a question that this is so, you know, this is the question that parts from ignorance rather than understanding. Uh, and that as a teacher, I'm sure you can address, and that is that as you describe to your own students sometimes, your undergraduate students in particular, I'm thinking, uh, the work that you do and what happens when you write a book like what you've written, right? Um, how do you convey to them the um, you know, what, what if, if you had to summarize it really briefly, what is the most important thing you learned writing the book? We obviously went into it with a lot of ideas and a lot of knowledge, 
but that knowledge gets transformed in the act of writing and investigation. And I was wondering, what, what surprised you along the way? Uh, what kinds of things were, did you end up different, thinking differently about than when you began? That's a great question. Um, I think something that surprised me was also the kind of the shifting interest points or the ways I came into it. There was some, when I initially started, I was much more, um, and this started as a dissertation that I then revised, but in the dissertation framework, I was interested in not so much the question of, of travel. Travel was something that actually came into the project later. I was thinking of transnational, really emphasizing this transnational and translation and focusing solely on late 19th century and late 20th century as what were moments that I thought were points in common and this sort of idea of Brazil on the precipice of greatness in part informed by the political and the sort of exuberance around Brazil in the early 2000s and early 2010s. And as I kept writing and I kept doing, doing research and different political moments happened and there were moments of protest and there were moments of just mm. um, questioning sort of that idea of is this the going to be Brazil's moment on the global stage made me think more critically of that framework and also recognize the importance of seeing the sort of um, cyclical nature of some of these practices and also mm -hmm. thinking that of the persistence of and the, the sort of strong return of nationalism even at moments when we were thinking that oh this might be about a sort of Brazil's and it's all on the global stage in terms of its literature. It's always this transnational, very visible processes. And so I had to think more about and was somewhat surprised to think of this kind of the both the similarities and types of discourses that I saw at these different moments throughout really distinct periods of Brazilian history, but also how that it invites a questioning of the sort of narrative of progress itself, right? And the sort of ideas of uh, celebratory discourses. And I was interested in those moments. And I think what I was discovered and found and really enriched it was spending some time in archives, reading authors, writing to each other, and like writing about the complaints that they were having and the like market difficulties. I felt like, oh, there's something of a difficult translation that can't be published now because of market problems. And then reading letters of the translator in the late 20s, early 30s, saying similar things like, oh, after the depression in the US, publishers don't want these works by Brazilians and that. And so it was interesting to kind of get that more personal face to some of these experiences rather than just think of them as statistics or that, but to have the, you know, with the writer Mario Gendragi complaining to his friend, of, oh, the translator seems to be doing good work. I don't know if I, or I'm not really sure I trust her and she's not giving me the chapter I want. And the sort of those elements helped to, I think, I don't also humanize the process in a way that I think surprised me because so often you think of these canonical figures of literary studies and they're sort of exist on a bookcase or within yeah. encyclopedia or within these sort of canonical features without thinking of no they wrote and they complained about what a translator was doing to their work and they had the sort of similar fears and worries and all those sorts of things that I you know have maybe talked about with friends or heard them complaining about in the process of translation or I faced as a translator and to think of that as like something that is always involved in the process was also um, interesting and um, yeah, changed how I was thinking about the project. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, there are a couple of questions now. I don't know if you can see them. Uh, one is rather long, but interesting. And the other is yeah. shorter. <laughs> okay. I'm going to take a minute to look at those. Yeah. Um, so Marcelo, thank you so much for the question and for the description of the, the thinking about Guimarães Hawes' work and the translations. Um, I haven't really analyzed in some ways, Paulo might be better since he's written more extensively on Guimarães Hawes' work, but what I've seen and the sort of, and why I was thinking of I, you're very right in saying and in identifying the problems of this English translation. And the English translation was started and then was finished um, 
uh, by someone who's actually not that familiar with Portuguese in some ways. And there is a tendency to remove, as you're saying, the wordplay, the neologisms, the, the real innovation and distinctiveness of the prose in that translation. And as a result, it's a translation that even the title itself, right, the devil to pay in the black backgrounds, raises these, I don't, it's, it's, it really reduces the text and transforms it into something that is much more a flattened, but also sort of stereotypical vision, right, of thinking and remove some of the mysticism, the, the elements that are uh, more ephemeral or distinctive of, of Hawes's work. And in, pairing, in comparing, I think your comparison that you're making between Hawes and Joyce is a really relevant and interesting one. Um, and I'm not, I'm not familiar with the translation of Joyce into Portuguese, but I think that what you're saying, it's pointing to, I think, at least what Alison and Trucken is now trying to do with the translation or the retranslation of Guimarães Hawes and Grandes into English. And there's a really interesting essay and an excerpt of her translation um, on Words Without Borders that was published, I think now about five years ago, where she's talking about the process, where she's going through and thinking of how she's playing with the neologism. She's trying to play with and capture the word play and how it's the challenges that she's faced with it and the mm -hmm. difficulty of the text and how the text is kind of pushing through, but that it also required her just have the time to do it. So her getting that was a basis of, there was a competition and she had to submit an example. And then she was selected by the people who had the rights, the translation rights. And then after that, she's now got, had to get, she's gotten grants, she's gotten other things to be able to spend an extensive period of time translating. So your question of related to commercial, I think is more the question then, and maybe in the 1960s, at the moment where why Brazilian literature was being published was in association with a sort of lead over from the Latin American boom and desires for works that looked more like Cien Años de Solidad and were kind of conventional narratives, right? And I think at that moment, the translators and Knopf, it was published by Knopf, it was expected to fit more into that type of conventional boom narrative. Um, and I think there's now a space for challenging that is maybe related to it, but I think in the contemporary moment, there's a space for other types of approaches that do not mm -hmm. fall into cultural superiority to the same extent. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't know if, Paul, if you have anything else to add to um, that. Yeah, I'd like to, maybe I could add just one more thing, which is that um, uh, works, Latin American works, Portuguese or Spanish, that extensively rely upon or work on uh, folk and vernacular cultures and folk and vernacular language, uh, always posit an extra challenge to the translator. Um, I could say, you know, if, if, if to simplify this question, okay, you have a narrator that speaks Portuguese that's clearly from one region of Brazil. Okay. And, and you're going to translate this text into English. What do you do? Do you, do you give the, that character an accent from the South, from, from where? I mean, it's, it's, uh, 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 you you have to, of course, this is translators uh, work with similar challenges. I'm, I'm not saying it's un untranslatable because in the in the very sense of the word, because of this, but it poses a, um, a challenge to to translators. And and I think I don't have um, uh, numbers or, or, or sort of a research to tell you about this, but my general feeling is that there is a tendency uh, for people that uh, translations into English, there is a, a tendency to flatten the language and to bring the language into a sort of neutral contemporary English. 
uh, I think the, mar the, the market, the, the book market understanding of a translatable book is a book that is written in neutral contemporary Portuguese, because that way it can easily be translated into neutral contemporary English. And, and I think that's what they mean by translatability. So whenever you have works such as Macunaíma and Grande Sertão Veredas that work extensively, not imitating accents or, or, or folk culture, but, but working with these, ele these cultural elements and including them into their final product, the translation is going to be uh, on the one hand, you can say more difficult. On the other hand, you can say more interesting <laughs> because it's going to offer you more. I know that a famous translator, Gregory Habasa, who was very successful translating a number of, well, his greatest success would be the translation of A Hundred Years of Solitude from Gabriel Garcia Marquez, which became a, 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 an extremely successful book when translated into English. Gregory Habasa told me a few years ago, that he was offered Grande Sertão Veredas, and that he refused, and that he said, it's too much work, it's going to take a long time, and uh, and so I, I passed. You know, uh, it's a personal, his personal decision, but as you can see, um, there are a number of things involved also in the commercial side of translations. Of course, Guimarães Rosa was very happy to have his book translated by Knopf because, because Knopf was a, a major uh, 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 publisher in the United States. He had, had very good translations to other languages that were released by smaller presses. And, because, and that had, of course, limited a little bit the the um, impact of those translations. And so he was excited about this, but, and, and, and perhaps he wasn't as, um, so he accepted that the book be translated by somebody who, by the way, translated Sagarana very well. <laughs> Sagarana is a wonderful translation by uh, Harriet Dionis. But she, she, I mean, it was too hard for her, I think, because, because she didn't know Portuguese enough or she didn't know Brazilian culture enough to, 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 to respond to that. And interestingly enough, I've, I've, I've had access to the letters, to the correspondence between Guimarães Rosa and Harriet Dionis. And, and, uh, and Guimarães Rosa uh, mentions Joyce when he's saying, you know, my Portuguese is, is more playful, more experimental, more uh, the strange. <laughs> Think of Joyce's uh, 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 Ulysses. It's, it's a bit more, you know, he's trying uh, another problem. Guimarães Rosa could communicate in English, but did not know English as much as he did, for example, German or Italian and could not really suggest so much trans, uh, solutions in English. So that is another thing to consider. So there's a host of, a host of things involved in translations. And we are very hopeful that this new translations will, will you know, hopeful, but not too much, not too, I don't want to have a, a exceeding expectations that Guimarães Rosa is going to become super famous or something like this. Um, it's 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 a challenging work of literature, but I hope it's it can play replace Guimarães Rosa and Mário de Andrade um, here in English uh, speaking cultures. Thank you, Paulo. Uh, Dr. Byrne, there's just one other question. If you have a minute to, we don't have much yeah. time. To get so the other question is the question more broadly of what we can we gain from venturing into international works and how can we access them? Say mentioning, or maybe there's another question as That's well. Fine. Okay, there's a couple of others I think now that I'm not seeing as much. Uh, they just follow up on, on what Paulo was saying. Okay, okay. Um, but so the other question about this idea of what we can gain from international thinking of and venturing into international works is one, I think, 
it's the importance of reading of translation is also it's a way to think of worlds beyond ourselves, right? It's sort of thinking of beyond our day-to-day -day experiences, beyond the cultural familiarity and backgrounds that we have. And for instance, I am not someone that I do not know Russian, I do not know Arabic, I do not know all these other languages, right? And so reading in translation is really critical because it allows me to think of, all right, both historical experiences from different times, but also kind of contemporary ways. And I think as, you know, thinking of, oh, I'm interested, I often, you know, have read or thought about, you know, maybe political issues in a particular region, and yet thinking of a cultural representation, be it a literary text, or also watching international films, right, or sort of other forms of cultural works can provide another angle to understand those contemporary dynamics or societal experiences in other parts of the world. So my that would be sort of my general plug for why departments of modern languages and literatures and cultures matter and why we should sort of think of reading and translation and reading uh, the sort of broader international works. And I'd say as a place to sort of, where can you get started or how do you find things? I'll do a small plug for actually OU's own world literature today. If you're thinking of like excerpts, translations, and you're not wanting to fully read a novel or because I think there's also a tendency, maybe we're not reading novels as much. I don't know, pandemic has changed our ability to focus and we want short pieces of literature. Those are great ways to sort of read an excerpt of something that may be translated in the future but hasn't been fully yet, or at least to expose you to an author that you're interested in. Um, similarly, Words Without Borders is a great website that similarly has and often has places that are even marginal within the book market. So for instance, I recently did a great um, issue on Cabo, uh, Cape Verdean literature, right? Cabo Verde, which was the, uh, the island um, archipelago off of the coast of Africa. That was a Portuguese colony until the 1970s. Mm -hmm. um, it has really fascinating sort of literary works, but they're works that aren't translated often or that you don't think of that don't reach a type of international visibility. So those spaces I think are great ways to think and maybe discover new writers, um, these sort of online publications about. And then also there are really some small independent presses like New Directions, Open Books or Open Letter. Um, Rochester has this uh, publication that's called the, the 3% Initiative and they have their own um, open letter books. Um, the Center for the Art of Translation in California and based in San Francisco also publishes translations. Deep Vellum, which is based in uh, Texas, has been publishing in especially Latin American works. So writers like Cristina Rivera Garza and others are getting published through there. Um, so those would be some of the ideas of where to look for works in translation um, and sort of why to think about reading more broadly in international works. Very good, thank you very much. Oh, before, before, before we close, Charles, before we close, Charles, I'll just like to say that I will be teaching in the spring intermission. I'll be teaching um, uh, an intensive course on modernism in the Americas. So we are going to read a bunch of things in translation, mm -hmm. translations from works in Spanish, Portuguese, alongside works in English. Mm -hmm. And next fall, I will teach a class that is called Literatures and Cultures of um, Portuguese speaking countries where we're going to have literature from Portugal, from Brazil, and from the six African countries, mm -hmm. all of them in translation. The class is entirely in English. Mm -hmm. You're all invited to, 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 to join us and, and, and read some literature in translation. <laughs> well, that's great. Sounds like a fascinating course. And there's really great work coming from Angola, Mozambique, other parts of Lusophone Africa right yeah, now too. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much. Uh, on, on that note, I do need to bring it to a close just because of the time, but uh, well, obviously we can continue this conversation. Uh, but I, yes. I do want to thank all of the webinar attendees. Um, thank all of those who posed questions, everyone else for your attention this afternoon. Uh, I'd like to thank very much our speaker, Dr. Krista Brun, for sharing her discoveries, her travels and translations with us. Uh, like to thank our colleague, uh, Paulo Moreira, for his comments and questions and enthusiasm. Uh, and also some of the people that um, helped make this possible, uh, Stephanie Sager, Beth Young, Mara McAndrew, all contributed in different ways to bring this event out. Uh, and just to say, this is the last event of the semester for the Center for the Americas. Uh, 
but we will be back in the fall uh, with events on elections in Latin America. Uh, we hope to sponsor or co-sponsor a session with a Cuban and Chilean author uh, that are coming here for World of Literature today. Um, we hope to have an event on the Caribbean uh, and uh, a few other things. So um, we look forward to seeing everybody uh, back in the, uh, in the fall semester. Thank you very much.